Jeremy Glassenberg, product lead at DocuSign. He's an experienced product leader of over 13 years with a proven track record of building and monetizing platforms such as Box and TradeShift. He's a mentor to many startup accelerators and has managed several developer communities. So Jeremy is going to share with us the success and failure stories and the lessons learned while designing embedded platforms. Welcome, Jeremy. How are you? I am doing well. How are you doing today? I'm good. Thank you so much. It was great talk uh, back in Hong Kong API days, and I'm looking forward for the talk today. Same here. Thank you for the uh, for the invitation again. Wonderful. Cool. Are you? So the slide is there. We are able to hear your um, uh, voice. So I think it's all good. Great. Over to you. All right. Sure. So I think we are good to go. Doing the usual remote conference quick audio tests. And yeah. Well, uh, welcome everyone. It's uh, good to meet you all. Uh, the name is Jeremy. Uh, and as mentioned, I've basically been working on platforms for quite a while. And today we are going to be talking about what I call embedded integration platforms, which is basically where you are enabling third party tools to integrate, not just via API, but to actually integrate into your own interface. Uh, we're going to go through the history of this, the many, many spectacular failures in this space, as well as the more recent successes. And from all these lessons, what does it take to actually run an embedded framework like that uh, successfully? Uh, so first, going through my most hated slide, the About Me slide. And you've already heard a little bit. Basically, I've been working on APIs for about 13 years on many platforms. They're most well known for Box. They also manage the developer platform at uh, TradeShift. That's a supply chain company that's now in the multi-billion dollar category. Uh, and oh, there we go. And uh, currently, I am part of an API initiative over at uh, DocuSign. I've also mentored many startups in the API space and on a consulting basis have uh, helped many companies launch their APIs. In the process, I've also worked with many companies on their APIs, and I've seen many successful platforms, many failures during this time. But let's get into the more interesting stuff. First, the history of embedded integration frameworks in the context of modern history of, of APIs. I always like to start this by noting a little bit of the recent trends in, in API world. Going back to around 2008, 2009, uh, 2009 was the year that was known as the year of the API craze, when we had gone from a few successful APIs and web services to basically every company with a website wanting to launch an API. API suddenly got cool. Now, during that time, there was a lot of experimentation. The technology kind of got ahead of use cases. And so many of those APIs were unsuccessful. But there were those APIs that figured out how to achieve product market fit and take things to where we are today. And we've only seen the continued growth. But during that period, in that 2008 to 2010 period, during that experimentation, some opportunities really were lost. And there's one that I really want to come back to going back a few years because I saw an opportunity and I've seen the trend this is coming back. Well, let's look at what was lost back then. Uh, does anyone remember, we didn't, we're not doing this as a poll, but any of you remember this from Google? This was uh, iGoogle, actually going back to, I think, 2005. Uh, and it was basically an alternative homepage at Google. It was a customizable homepage. You could have a weather app. You could have news. You could have a calendar. And they actually let other developers build apps onto this thing and embed it inside of a Google homepage. It was part of something that became the, um, not the open, for the, the open social initiative, where basically they were encouraging other platforms to build something like this, other companies to enable third-party apps in their interface. You might remember LinkedIn, probably not. Uh, they had a system by which you could install a third-party app, including a box app that I was involved in, where this third-party content would actually be on your LinkedIn profile. Um, for box, you could install this box app and like choose a box file or folder, 
to display on your, your LinkedIn profile. Uh, some of you might remember it. Usually when I give this talk, most people don't. And there's a reason for that. They were kind of burying these. Um, this was a time when as APIs got popular, uh, many companies had this dream of making the web into its own operating system. In fact, literally there was a Y Combinator startup that tried to do that. They basically made a web page that looked like a desktop operating system. The idea being that you could install a bunch of apps onto this. It was all ajax I iframed in, um, but there are third party apps that could be built here and you could launch everything on the web and in one web page. It's a cool concept, but what's the purpose? What's the value proposition? And therein lay the challenge. We could see that there was opportunity here, but we were obsessed with the cool factor and not the value factor. And this is where before I dive too deep into the success, there's something I always emphasize in the world of APIs, and that is the need for applying design first principles or product principles for your APIs. Many of you have heard that slogan from the movies, if you build it, they will come. Product managers know that this doesn't actually work. In fact, the movie in which this quote comes from, Field of Dreams, not sharing too much, but basically what they build is a baseball field, and what they attract are the ghosts of the Chicago White Sox players who took a bribe to throw a World Series game. So when you think about it, the movie where this quote, quote come fr comes from actually is a product that doesn't really bring you the customers that you want. We know in the world of product management, you have to first understand what are the problems that customers have? What are the challenges that they have? And how do you provide a solution to that problem? As opposed to just building things that you think are cool and expecting customers to show up. It doesn't work anywhere else in product and it doesn't work for APIs either. And when you apply product principles and APIs, that's how the stripes and the Twilio's of the world happen. And that's where we started to see success in the world of embedded integration frameworks, where Gmail asked questions of, if people wanted to bring, what are the limitations after over a billion users have been using Gmail for years? What are the limitations people are finding? How do they want Gmail to work better with other things they use on a day-to-day -day basis? As Trello says, well, how can we make the Trello experience better? What do customers want to see? And what of these things can be solved through partners, through third-party developers. It's all about thinking through use cases. And when you do that, then we start to see success. So those apps like iGoogle and the LinkedIn integration from back in 2008, 2009, that didn't really pan out. And after this multi-year lull, over the last three, four, five-ish years, actually, we're really seeing a comeback. Google has been very successful with Gmail add-ons and Google Workspace add-ons in general. Uh, Shopify has grown massively with their developer marketplace, their ecosystem. Um, over at Wix.com, they have something called Corvid. They're really enabling third parties in many ways to integrate. And consistently, it's been about understanding what their customers want first, and then enabling partners to build those sort of apps. Now, I've had the privilege of being able to actually talk with product managers and developers at all of these companies, at Twitch, at Google Workspace, at Shopify, and they've shared their feedback as to the history of their platforms, what made them successful, what things to do and what things to watch out for. First and foremost, on a strategic level, they've all emphasized, don't just plop iframes or other technology in random places of your interface just because it's going to look cool to have a third-party tool there. If you just build things because you think they're cool, your, pl your platform is going to look like something that may be cool in the 1980s. And you know what? The 1980s weren't cool, okay? All these platforms that were successful had real use cases. They were waiting to see what customers tried to do and got feedback from customers. In fact, many of these platforms first let customers hack solutions on top of what they had to work around limitations that their product had. For example, 
Gmail for years had just allowed, I mean, they couldn't stop it, but they did make it easy for developers to build Chrome extensions to inject things into the Gmail interface. Shopify discovered that customers were using their external APIs to just kind of rebuild much of the Shopify interface in their own system because of certain limitations to these products. And that's where they could validate that there was an opportunity to open things up more. And with that, I like to emphasize one thing in the world of marketplace management. Because in the end, if you are bringing third party tools into your interface, you're really gonna have an apps marketplace. These developers are building on the assumption that you are bringing them customers, customers who are already using your product. This is important for your launch plan. Every one of the successful embedded frameworks that I've seen had users, many users, before they launched their platforms. There are many companies out there that launched APIs and then got developers and got customers. But when you have an embedded framework, it's a marketplace model and a marketplace model where you need customers first. I've seen actually many platforms not do this. They assumed that these embedded frameworks were about building, gaining new users. And that can happen. But you first need to actually have users and then build out your platform accordingly. Now, I can actually talk for hours on that. There's actually another course I give just on that topic. Um, but that's what I want to emphasize. There's a marketplace aspect to this. And make sure you have customers and consequently use cases before I start going down this path. Now let's move from strategy into tactical product. Let's look at the kind of technologies that have gone into these sort of frameworks. These have all been tested, they've had their pros and cons. We're gonna go through all three of these. First and foremost are the iframes. These are really the most common. They've been the longest running solution for these sort of platforms. Cards, I'll dive a little bit more into this, but basically cards are the trending opportunity to alleviate many of the performance and security concerns, mostly around iframes. And finally, there's what I call triggers, but it's more miscellaneous. It's just thinking outside the box. We look at the user experience and say, what else can we do to bring partners into our interface? First and foremost are the iframes. The longest running default solution for many years is where most of the platforms are built upon. It's the easiest option. You can just in HTML, enable an iframe and let third parties specify what URL they want you to load. It's easy for you. It's easy for partners. They can just create content in HTML and JavaScript and just set it to load in, in your system. Uh, but yeah, I think we all, most of us know about the challenges here namely security, that you are letting a third party put HTML, JavaScript, their own code into your system. On top of that, they may be able to update this whenever they want. You can test it the first time they launch, but if they're hosting this on their own site, they can update it whenever. And if they get hacked, if they are compromised, that means that their compromised system is now affecting your site. But it's not just about security performance has been a lesser known issue. But if you talk with companies that have hosted these sort of marketplaces, these sort of platforms, they've run into performance issues and they've warned me many times that they launched platforms where you know customers, consumers would start to install all these apps and all they needed was two or three, three or more apps. Um, I framed into one page and you could see the site slowing down. Now, overall, this is still a very popular solution. Um, it's just that many companies have, you know, borne the risk here that, you know, they're working with partners who may cause issues on your own website. What's been trending? Uh, and sometimes this is because the security team comes in and just says, heck no to iframes. Sometimes teams just say performance is too much of, of a concern. But there's also usability reason to go to what we're calling cards, which is basically saying we are predefining a limited set of components that you as a developer can use in the interface. You can code to this, but we're not gonna have client-side code of yours running in our system. This is programmable, but it's a very limited interface. Uh, this is not actually just about security or performance. Some companies have decided that this is just 
the only way to make the user experience good if their product is very, very mobile dependent. Iframing can be a little bit janky on the desktop. It can be very janky on mobile. So um, many co companies, if they know they're going to be mobile focused, if they know that majority of their users are most of the time using mobile, they prefer to go with cards. It does play friendlier on mobile. We've seen this with Gmail, for instance. They want the card route, maybe for security, maybe for, for performance, but a big advantage to cards is that it allowed them to open up the Gmail add-ons in the Gmail mobile app. So you integrate with Gmail, you're part of the mobile experience. That said, this is very limiting, and especially when Gmail first launched cards, many companies I advise were excitedly building into this platform, and they walked away just saying, it's just too limited. Uh, and they went back to actually creating hacky Chrome extensions. Now, I'm happy to say that Gmail and other companies that have um, built card-based platforms, they've learned from this, they've gathered feedback, they're extending their cards more, um, and so it's getting better, but it is still limited. Now, some places have figured out how to work around these limitations. Intercom, which is one of my favorite examples of this, they have both cards, but they allow for iframes. What they basically do is encourage developers to use cards as much as possible. And if they just hit a fundamental limitation in cards, yes, it's okay to bring in the iframe as part of the experience. It's something I'm encouraging as long as your security team is okay with it. Now, I want to emphasize that there's more to this than just iframes and cards. I would say the majority of these embedded frameworks are using those. Um, but many of them also, here or there, are trying some other things. As an example, Google Drive, Box to this too, allow you to right-click on a file, let's say it's an image, and edit it in an image editor or send it to be signed with DocuSign. Um, and it would basically, it wouldn't iframe, there wouldn't be an iframe here, it would just direct you to the partner site. There would be some OAuth, some API connectivity, but you literally just be opening up a new window. Um, Google had something for Google Docs and Google Sheets. You could actually have a custom menu added to the experience. So they're figuring out what can we do to make our UX, UI, just a little bit more friendly through some creative things going beyond iframes and cards. And this is what I want to encourage here. Just keep thinking outside the box. There are future opportunities here. There's plenty more we can discuss on the user experience for these platforms and the technologies behind them. But I also want to make sure that we dive into the developer experience. It's not just about enabling cards, enabling iframes. What else can you do so that your developers who are building on your platform are empowered to really build the best apps and can do it as easily as possible? I'm going to start with the basics. For any sort of embed framework, you're going to want to have APIs. Uh, and it's not just about enabling your basic APIs uh, within these embedded frameworks. You want to create new APIs just for these apps that allow them to interact with the page that they're on. Trello allows you to make updates to your board. Google Docs has a system where you can create that customized menu through uh, through um, through APIs. Box and Google Drive has have ways of posting notifications into the interface. So just think about how can you allow these embedded apps to when they're limited in one space to a card or an iframe, how can they safely interact outside of that through APIs? Next, just like APIs, how it benefits to have SDKs and libraries, that's very helpful in this space. And JavaScript is, is just magic here. It's every company eventually figures out it is just time to build a JavaScript library on top of, on top of your special APIs for these embed frameworks. And uh, what is interesting about this is once you enable the JavaScript library, many developers can just build apps entirely out of HTML um, and JavaScript, or just the card system and JavaScript. And JavaScript can work client-side. So it starts to allow you to run a platform such that developers can build and host everything on your system. 
because there's no server-side code. Um, I have seen platforms that allow you to host server-side code while it being these embedded frameworks. I'm not talking about them here, but it's, it's more complex, it's doable. But an easy thing is to just enable client-side JavaScript libraries for your, for your APIs for your embed frameworks. Um, and you actually see Google Apps Script too. It's something that I love working with. Google Apps Script um, is basically just that. It's just JavaScript, Google APIs, and they encourage teams to build, to make libraries for their other APIs. Next, if you, if you can get to this stage after building libraries on top of your APIs, is to really look at how developers are interacting. What are the patterns they're trying to do? There's usually consistencies in what they're trying to do, but where they're struggling. Salesforce kind of figured this out. Shopify really figured this out to provide pre-built components that can work with your APIs and have a slick interface that fits with your general theming. You don't require developers to use it, but if they use it, it saves them a lot of time in development and it allows their app to look nicer in your interface. So again, it becomes win-win. Just like when you're creating um, widgets to be embedded in other sites, it's basically that, but you're providing these components to live inside of your environment. You let developers build things freely, but use the components if they can. This is especially helpful in those iframe-based platforms. Um, now in the time that we have, I don't wanna to talk too much about server-side, I think we're a little bit over 20 minutes here. All right. Um, there's more that we can talk about here, including JavaScript hosting versus server-side code hosting. If people are interested, I'll, I'll save some time for Q&A for that. But I'll also make sure that we discuss some aspects of security. Even if you're not doing the iframe, security teams are not going to be very comfortable with third-party apps in your interface. Now, when it comes to the iframe, I should note, thanks to HTML5, you can set certain restrictions, like say we're gonna allow HTML but not allow JavaScript, um, or not allow pop-ups. So it's one thing to consider, um, but regardless of iframe versus card and those aspects of security, it's really important when you're looking, when you're thinking through the API for these frameworks to think about scopes. The scopes here are likely to be very different from the scopes of your external integrations. Uh, I find Google Drive is the easiest example of this issue. Let's say you want to integrate, you want to work with uh, an image editor in Google Drive. So you upload an image into Google Drive, you can right click and edit that in, in Google Drive. What access rights should that app have? Should it have read permission? Well, it has to be able to view the file. It also should have write permissions because um, it has to be able to edit the file and save it back. But all this app needs to do, all this image editor really needs to do is work with the one file that you've selected and sent to it. And Google Drive ordinarily says for an external integration to get full access to everything in your Google Drive account. For these integrations, Google instead says, no, 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 the apps only need access to the files that you're, that you're creating, the files that you're editing through these apps. Trello does something similar. If you're working with an app on one project board, that app will only have access to the content on that project board. If that app is meant to work on tickets, on cards that you have in this project, that app may be restricted to only know the content on the card where you've launched it from. And so you're limiting, you're setting the scopes based on your interface. I'm not going to say who, but some platforms have not thought that through and they've opened up privacy holes and security holes. So it's one last thing I really emphasize. This does open up a different set of security issues that you will not encounter just in external APIs. It's one last thing to really think about here. Watch your security and also just keep a lookout for new opportunities and new technologies. Cards, there's a lot of iteration going on here. Those are gonna get better. AMP, which is basically saying you can use HTML and JavaScript in a limited scope. I've seen many of these frameworks starting to dabble and test. We wanna just enable that instead of cards to give developers that freedom and responsibility though. Freedom to build what they want while still making sure we have security. So I think over the next few years, we've had this comeback in these frameworks. We're gonna see some new better tech coming. So just keep a lookout and think as you think, what else can you do to bring third parties 
into your system smoothly. All right. Um, I think we have just a few more minutes for Q&A. So thank you all for putting up with me for 25 minutes here. Do you have any questions? Hi, Jeremy. Thank you. So uh, just uh, one question. Um, how do you relate this uh, to uh, low code and no code initiatives? That is that is a good question. And um, this is something that's kind of coming up recently. So you know, I'm talking about some technology ideas that have been around since you know before 2008, 2009. Um, and as I was, you know, creating this presentation, writing content about this trend in, in the frameworks, there was this other trend going on of low code, no code, operating separately, but there is some overlap here. Many of these solutions now, these embedded frameworks, they also want to make it easy for people to build these sort of plugins. Um, you kind of see it in the, you know, the UI component aspect. They want to make it easier and easier to build these apps. So to what extent you need to build to be a developer? Um, often what they do is they, they treat no-code, low-code as a separate set of solutions, but they're watching what's going on there. On the no-code, low-code front, I find also it, it really is important in both these cases to think through the personas. Who are the developers building these apps? Are they going to be customers who want to build apps for internal use? Are these developers who want to build apps um, and then publish them externally? Are they casual developers who maybe are happy coding in JavaScript but not doing anything too intense in a framework or hosting stuff themselves? Are they just not even experienced developers? Um, many of these low-code, no-code solutions have to decide to start no-code. They don't want to be low-code at all. Others definitively want to be low-code. And I've seen this as I as I spoke with many of these platform providers, this topic came up similarly to Loco Noco, where they said some said we want to target the casual developers. Others said they really want to actually target the hardcore developers and provide tools that are seemingly low code, but actually meant to just make the lives of advanced developers easier. So that question of who your persona is, what kind of developers do you mean working on this? That's gonna come up. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you. Um, and if you have to uh, give uh, some gold standards, so what recommendation do you give to define a gold standards for designing and embedded platforms? That That is another question. And um, you know, I shared many examples here of companies that were successful. Um, if you look at all these platforms, there are there, there, there still are many inconsistencies in how these platforms are implemented. In fact, Google Workspace used iframes for a long time for Google Docs add-ons, uh, but then they used cards for the Gmail add-ons. And uh, as I noted, you know, Gmail had its challenges initially in enabling enough um, in cards for developers to really build the things that they wanted to build. Overall, I would say Google Workspace is one of those examples of, uh, I'd say gold standard. They're still progressing, but they figured out a, the user experience, where to get this to fit, um, and B, how to make cards work. Uh, they also have, um, they've been updating their publishing process. And so there's some things to observe there. I find also when it comes to say hosting, App Script, they're the best, they're the easiest. Um, Salesforce has built out some more advanced options. Uh, they built them out actually long ago in the early 2000s. App Exchange, um, Apex, these things have been highly successful. Um, there are newer initiatives going on, but I still find that Salesforce has been very effective in terms of their marketplace um, and in managing aspects like security. Trello, I think, is actually a great place to just start, though. They figured out how to enable particular locations as to where to embed these integrations and also how to make it very easy for developers to get started, to define their app and have a set of APIs that they can use to interact with the interfaces. So Trello, I find is the simplest, easiest place to start. Um, Google Workspace, I think is a good place for the next step. Just watch as they continue to iterate. Mm -hmm. Salesforce, it's a heavier one. It's a little bit older, but it's a good one to look at. Wonderful. 
Thank you so much, Jeremy. Thanks for all your answers and your presentation. It mm -hmm. was uh, wonderful. And uh, looking forward for more such stories in other API Day conferences. Thank you.